In November of this year, the eyes of the world are going to be upon us. There is a moment in history that is coming. In the lifetimes of many of the people here this afternoon, there is an event going to be taking place in Glasgow that is more significant than any event that has taken place in this country for a long, long time, probably for generations. Why is it important? It's important because the governments of the world have the chance to stop this rock from going any further. And it's important because they are not going to take that chance. Just like this government are doing, they are going to fail us. In this episode of Shaping the Future, I'm speaking to Professor Rupert Reed on the eve of his trial that has since taken place, resulting in a guilty verdict and a very modest fine handed down. Here we discuss the role of disinformation organisations like the Global Warming Policy Foundation, who have spent the last decade denying the threat that climate change poses to ordinary people. As we head to COP26 Glasgow, many politicians, let alone climate scientists, are calling this summit a last chance to save the future for humanity. Despite this, pundits and mainstream media outlets such as The Economist are warning us to prepare for disappointment. This should come as no surprise, thus confirming the successful work of climate denialism over the last decades. The job ahead is too unpalatable for policymakers to sell to civilians, despite the growing eco-anxiety amongst us. From Sunday, I will be reporting from the COP, speaking to many people who I have interviewed for this podcast and many more. We will also be live streaming an event on the 8th of November titled Adapt Now on my YouTube channel, so please do join us. I have two more interviews to present very shortly, but time is making it hard to turn these around, but I will do my best. Thanks for listening to all these interviews and sharing your feedback, which I always try to read. You can subscribe on YouTube or any major podcast channel. You can also visit my site, gen.cc, and you can also support my work via Patreon, which is linked in the notes. Thank you. Rupert, it's great to see you again. I want to start with the Tufton Street trial and also the denial on trial campaign that's seeking to flip the scenario where activists protesting climate and ecological destruction are being prosecuted by those responsible for undermining the global push to preserve a stable climate. What is the current status quo on all of this with you, your trial and the next steps? So yeah, time of, uh, of recording, we're just gearing up for the actual trial in London. And well, I think it's fair to say that myself and my fellow defendants, Claire Farrell and Jessica Townsend, are pleased with the extent to which already we've been able to shed a light on what the good folks, or should that be bad folks, of, uh, of Tufton Street are up to. Uh, and that's really, you know, that's the reason why we did the whole thing in the first place. So these are people who are trying to stop the uh, alarm being raised. So we're trying to stop them. And they, their actions are most effective when they take place out of the glare of full publicity when people don't really understand what's going on, especially obviously their secretive lobbying actions. And yeah, we've managed to shed some light on that. We'll do more during the trial. We hope that this is just the beginning, really. As you say, we aim this week and hereafter to put denial on trial to make it more and more difficult for the climate deniers to get away with what they're doing. And we're hoping to put the presiding judge in a difficult position uh, at the trial. We're hoping to get them to see, on the one hand, people who have tried everything uh, and are now on trial for um, undertaking a last resort. And on the other hand, those who frankly should really be on trial because as what I did that night shows, they have blood on their hands. I poured fake blood, all water soluble, it would have just washed off in time. Uh, over the uh, doorstep of the uh, Global, War Global Warming Policy Foundation. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing it needs to put these people in the spotlight. Okay, and it's a thread that's kind of running through some of the recent interviews. The Global Warming Policy Foundation have been active for a long time, and they've, they've got this sort of friendly sounding name in a way, and they, they hang very much in the shadows, but they are members of the British elite. You take Nigel Lawson at the yeah. top of the pyramid, if you like. Yeah. I mean, he's a 
in real terms, a sinister figure, a danger to people's safety with, oh, yeah. by protecting these policies and has been very effective in the last decade at least. How effective now is shedding a light and holding that light, I think, you know, in terms of moving into this decade? Do you think it's going to be a game changer? Well, so I think it's useful, as you say, Nick, to have some historical context here. So let's go back to 2009 where we had the hack at uh, the criminal hack at, uh, at UEA of uh, climate scientists' emails. Not just climate scientists, by the way, I was among those who was hacked uh, as a philosopher working uh, at UEA. And uh, that was spun um, by various nefarious interests into ridiculous pretend doubts about the climate science. And absolutely central in that effort was Nigel Lawson and the Global Warming Policy Foundation. It's important to note that the foundation was launched three days after the hack. Uh, you can regard that as coincidence if you like. Uh, I most certainly uh, do not. And we, to a quite a large extent, lost the, the following decade as a consequence of that kind of uh, uh, activity, that kind of denial which the GWPF pushed resolutely from then um, since. And Nigel Lawson, of course, has been central to that. Also Benny Pizer, who I debated at uh, Hey On Why uh, some years ago, uh, before I uh, moved to my more recent policy of saying oh, it's pointless debating with these people, the time for debating with them is past. It's the wrong debate to be having. Of course, they're trying to rebrand themselves now. The Global Warming Policy Foundation have just uh, rebranded as Net Zero Watch. So they're, they're trying to uh, act now as if they are you know, on the side of the little guy, which is you know, laughable if you see who, they're, who their funders and their, and their spokespeople are. And the way in which they're trying to do this may be clever. It's going to probably carry on shifting. But you know, when I was uh, debating with uh, Andrew Monfort of the GWPF on GB News recently, and the debate was supposed to be about um, net zero policies and not at all about the science otherwise I wouldn't have been on. You know, he still tried to put in there some kind of points of nonsense. He still said, for example, that he didn't think the temperatures had gone up, which is you know, just so risible, it's not even worth talking about. And he also spoke about there being good news all over the world at the very time when wildfires were killing people around the Mediterranean and in California. So meet the new deniers, same as the old deniers, really. Uh, and I, I do think it's very important that more and more pressure gets put on these people that we get to understand, for example, the influence they still have over government, especially when you have a conservative government. Although not only it should be noted that Labour's Graham Stringer is appallingly uh, on their board. And there'll be more revelations about this in the press just, re just recently. Hopefully our trial will catalyze more of that on the day and afterwards. And obviously anyone who's watching, you know, we'd urge you to, uh, to look into all this more and to share the word and to make sure that more people understand uh, what Tufton Street really means, what it's going to mean for our children. Yeah, and it is that closeness to, I mean, it's, there's a Global Warming Policy Foundation, but they do influence policy and they do get out there in the media or influence the media and they cause yep. pretty much a media shutdown of climate change discussion over the last decade. So I think, I mean, it's really valuable to bring all this out and actually identify that these are not voices of the people. They are voices of not voices small of the people, elite. and they're not really a think tank either. You know, as George Monbiot has has said, and as Open Democracy have said, these are really um, opaque uh, lobby groups uh, with a preset agenda, um, impervious to to uh, to facts or reason. And there's nothing to do with them but expose them, attempt to, to sideline them and seek to, to move past their dinosaur um, attitudes. Well, carrying on the theme of, sort of dinosaur attitudes, today we, we see the UK government using the law to try and prevent activism and trying to intimidate protesters. And recent polling shows that substantially high numbers of youth and the general public now agree with the protesters and agree with the concerns, especially of the protesters. Yeah. Are we approaching a point of major change in public response, do you think? Well, what an interesting and important question. Obviously, my answer is I hope so, but it's not just a hope. I think that we're getting wake up call after wake up call. I think that that's clear, right? That the climate, the weather, 
climate disasters keep on waking us up. What I also think is that more and more people are painfully coming to wake up to the lack of adequacy in government uh, responses, certainly in a country like uh, like this one, um, also in other countries like uh, the United States, basically in pretty much everywhere in the world, there are a few exceptions. You know, there are a few places like Costa Rica and New Zealand, which are doing relatively well. But if you're not in one of those places, then um, your so-called leaders really aren't. Uh, they're, they're not leaders at all. So as you say, Nick, Consciousness has been raised by these things and, crucially, as you say, by the movements that have risen up in response to this, by Fridays for Future, by Extinction Rebellion. In the UK, Extinction Rebellion have clearly ripped the Overton window wide open, and that's absolutely clear in opinion polls over the last uh, couple of years. So what next? Uh, is this um, the moment where there's going to be a big growth in Extinction Rebellion? Possibly. Is insulate Britain the future, greater escalation or radicalism? Possibly, but I'm skeptical. Uh, I don't see a huge public appetite for insulate Britain actions. The way I see things, and I've been arguing this in a series of publications recently, most recently a, a major essay in Perspectiva, the way I see things, the achievement, the real achievement of Extinction Rebellion, flanked by Greta Thunberg and David Attenborough, is to have opened up this space, which it may be for others to fill, others with a slightly more moderate message, or at least more, more, a slightly more moderate approach, and a slightly more inclusive approach. I mean, slightly more than Extinction Rebellion, which is, you know, obviously absolutely wonderful. I'm so proud of the time I spent with XR. I'm on trial with XR uh, uh, this week. XR has, as I've just said, achieved something absolutely extraordinary, which previous campaign groups in this country did not achieve. But it seems to me likely that the legacy of XR, the most important legacy, is opening this larger space for others to fill. And that's what I believe could happen starting now, really. I think it's already starting to happen. We're already starting to see it, perhaps in, in groups in the workplace like Lawyers for Net Zero, in uh, resilience-oriented um, uh, developments such as uh, transformative adaptation and climate emergency centres in the gradually growing and burgeoning um, parents movement, which of course I've written about at length in my book, Parents for a Future. And what I think is that at the end of COP, the end of this COP could be the moment at which this really starts to take off, because the end of COP is going to radicalise a lot of people and wake up a lot of people um, a lot more. Our Many of those people are going to be radicalised as much as to join Extinction Rebellion or even Insulate Britain. Well, I think some of them will, but I think most of them probably won't. I think most of them are probably looking for something that, if you will, lies somewhere sort of in between Friends of the Earth and the Wildlife Trusts on the one hand and Extinction Rebellion or Insulate Britain on the other. And this is the domain of what I'm calling the moderate flank, which I think could be filled by the parents' movement, by workplace-based activism, by a new wave of uh, community-based resilience building, which will be very much called for in response to the way in which COP is likely to fail us, because that, that implies directly that we, we can't avoid taking adaptation more seriously. So that's my hope, but it is also my expectation. I think it is certain that the climate movement, if you will, will grow during the next uh, few years as uh, disasters continue tragically to, to multiply. I think the way that COP26 is about, with near certainty, to fail us may be the single most important moment in catapulting that kind of development forward and potentially growing a huge, relatively inclusive so-called, I'm calling it a moderate flank, a climate movement for the many, if you will. That is what needs to happen, and I think it will happen. And as you say, you're going to be in Glasgow, I'll be in Glasgow, All the, pretty much all these groups will be in Glasgow, yeah. all, uh, mixing it up, and yet main, uh, protesting and the activism of Insulate Britain, for example, has had a lot of mainstream media negative press recently. And do you, have you got any thoughts, if we just zone in on Glasgow, of how the protest optics or how the police will interact with, what are your thoughts on the, the overall um, what's going to happen? 
yeah, everybody will uh, will be at Glasgow. Insulate Britain are going to be trying to put pressure on by uh, continuing to do what they do. There'll be various, as always, exciting and spectacular XR uh, actions. There's going to be a big march from the school strikers led by Greta on Friday the 5th, which I'm intending to be a part of. There'll be a huge march on November the 6th. Um, this is all great. My own view is that the most important moment in the summit is at the end, because that is when we will see whether or not uh, they've uh, failed us. I think it's near certain that they will fail us. And I think it's vital that, that at that point, we don't just go home with our tails between our legs. So anyone who can come to Glasgow and is watching this, I'd urge you to come and I'd urge you to come not so much in the middle. I mean, that's fine and great to participate on the fifth or sixth, but there'll be loads of people already doing that. If you can, come at the end, come and mark the moment on the 12th of November, which will, I think, go down in history when our leaders fail us and we decide uh, how to respond. If you can't come to Glasgow, then do something similar in London or wherever you are, uh, wherever you are around the country or uh, in, a, in a foreign capital city, perhaps even. Um, this, needs, this is a worldwide event, obviously. It's taking place in Scotland. It's being hosted by, by London, by the, uh, by the British government. Um, but it's a worldwide uh, event and it needs to be marked all over the world. And above all, it needs to be marked on November the 12th. So I'll be there with uh, Greens Can uh, on November the 12th. And we'll be calling on people, assuming that they don't, uh, the, the leaders so-called don't uh, really surprise us and actually lead. Then we'll be uh, leading a response, some um, action, potentially NVDA, but not necessarily arrestable on November the 12th in Glasgow, probably in the, in the afternoon. That is an absolutely key moment for anyone who's interested enough in these things to be watching this okay well that's a fabulous place to finish so i look forward to seeing you very shortly good luck on thursday um i know that that's also not the end really because it opens up the denial on trial and everything else so there's yeah. lo lots of really interesting stuff happening thank you very much Rupert. i look forward to seeing you very shortly thanks nick yes i'll see you in glasgow Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.